without any further ado and delays, hi once again and welcome to the Ballerine Catsman Network Integrated Approach to Community Land Management webinar. I've just been talking a little bit um, about our day-to-day -day program. Not sure if anyone's heard that, but now I'm going to get cracking and get straight into it. And I'm very excited, a little bit nervous to be talking to, to such a loud, sorry, a large audience, but hopefully um, you'll get something out of this presentation. So my name is Matt Crawley and I'm the program manager for the Ballerine Catchment Network, which I'll also refer to as BCN throughout the webinar. I'd like to start by thanking Landcare Australia Limited and the Landcarer team for this opportunity to present on this topic and the Ballerine Catchment Network model. At BCN, we've been using Landcarer for quite a while now and would recommend you checking it out if you've not done so already. You can sign up at landcarer.com.au. The Ballerine Catchment Network acknowledges the Wadawurrung, traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. So a bit of housekeeping first. The presentation will go for approximately 40 minutes with five minutes of question time at the end. Type your questions, comments into the comments box underneath the screen. A bit of a tip, think of a question or comment at the end of each theme and I'll reply to all the questions in that section after the presentation. To ask questions or make comments by a land carer, you must be signed in, so just remember that. And email Trish at hi there at landcare.com.au with any technical issues. During the presentation, I'm going to concentrate on four themes, and these include theme one, our model, who, what, and where are we? Theme two, how and why does it work? Theme three, how does it work in practice leading to outcomes? And theme four, what can you learn from us? So starting with theme one, let's look at the following. Where are we? The Ballerine Catchment Network model. What exactly is it? And how did it come about? So some context first. Where does the BCN operate from? Our boundaries, extent and range. Let's, let's zoom in for a closer look. Let's take a look around the Ballerine. This is where the groups and land managers are located. Most reflect the town areas and public reserves and land systems. I'll come back to this slide at the end of the presentation to reflect on also. So try taking a mental note of the layout and groups. The Ballerine Catchment Network operates in the city of Greater Geelong and borough of Queenscliff municipalities. With 137 kilometres of coastline, 34,000 hectares of land, southern facing ocean, north and east facing bays, including Swan Bay and Port Phillip Bay, the Lake Connawarri, Ramsar wetland and estuarine systems, it's fair to say there's a lot going on, a diversity of landscapes and land systems. Most of the towns dot the coast, towns you may have heard of like Queenscliff, Port Arlington, Ocean Grove and Bowen Heads. With the central areas of the Ballerine mainly for agriculture with a diversity of cropping, horticulture and livestock. However, the agricultural land is fast diversifying and also under pressure from development, being under one hour, 30 minutes from Melbourne by car or train, or one hour via the new ferry from Port Arlington. So now you know where we are, it's time to look at who we are. The network is 22 years old, established in 1998. The key is that we are an integrated network, 
not one dimensional and open to any group or organization as long as it fits our model and values. I've been with the network for 13 years now and I started as the Ballerine Land Care and Coast Care Coordinator. And as we grew and expanded, my role changed to what it is now, Program Manager. Importantly, one function of this is that it has allowed me to grow and develop professionally without feeling the need to run off to another larger organisation to advance my career. When I first started with BCN, our structure was approximately 20 groups and organisations. We had 1.4 FT full-time equivalents and two, maybe three funding sources. And these were all government grants. Fast forward to now, and we have 32 groups and organisations, increased diversity, six staff with this number set to grow, five FTEs and roughly 30 different investment streams representing 30 different projects and programs. Again, a lot going on, but in the right way, as this directly equates to more environmental initiatives and outcomes. So sure, in economic terms, growth is good, but what does it mean for the environment? Well, to me, what this all means is more education and awareness raising leading to a more engaged, aware and involved community and resulting in protecting and enhancing the environment. And that has to be good. Now, let, now let's break that previous slide down as there are a lot of names to digest. Roughly this equates to two foreshore committees of management, three non-government organisations, two local municipalities, three state agencies and statutory authorities, 22 community groups, friends of, coast care and land care. This model has all the traditional elements of community environment groups, land care, coast care and many friends of groups. These are the integral part of the network and much of our efforts go into these groups. However, as we all know, there is value in looking to diversify the model of support and inclusion and look to engage with the non-converted groups. Therefore, we started to include neighbourhood houses, community associations and others as part of the network. And this has led to significant partnerships and outcomes from on-ground on works, capacity projects and education resources. We have added other partners as part of the service delivery, like surf lifesaving clubs, yacht clubs, sporting clubs and events. CFA, Cemeteries Trust, etc., which are not a formal part of the network, but nevertheless, we've established relationships and partnerships with them all. Many of the non-traditional environment groups were looking for ways to become involved as they had built up environment pillars as part of their group or, or organisation. They just didn't know how to get involved and go about it. The BCN invited them into our network and provided opportunities for projects, initiatives and collaboration. So let's move on to theme two, how and why does it work? During this theme, I would like to look at a model born out of necessity, governance and structure, and all sides being equal. In 1997, a series of meetings were held to halt the declining health of Swan Bay, a combination of nutrients, sediments, inappropriate recreation activities, grazing over salt marsh and the shoreline, litter and plastics was affecting the health of Swan Bay. Algal blooms, seagrass meadows in decline, affecting fish nurseries and migratory wader habitat was the diagnosis. The solution, however, required some lateral thinking. The normal approach of government bodies, land managers, landholders and community groups working in isolation was not going to achieve the, des the desired result. An integrated approach was required. Putting to one side community group and organisation labels, boundaries and jurisdictions to work on a holistic plan. Born out of necessity, but here for the long term, this model continued to grow, now encapsulates the whole of the Ballerine Peninsula and continues to diversify and evolve. where it all started. 
Farmers, community groups, Parks Victoria and other land managers collaborated on the project. The western shoreline of Swan Bay was fenced off, revegetated and rehabilitated bit by bit. Ballerine Land Care Group, Swan Bay Environment Association, Friends of Edwards Point with the Swan Bay Integrated Catchment Management Committee coordinating the project. It took 10 years to fence off and protect the salt mass and critical habitat for the orange-bellied parrot. The value from grazing this land was marginal with little nutrient value, but the value to the OBP was critical. This integrated model set up the framework and template for the next 23 years. So now let's delve into governance and structure. This model that evolved started to bring some different and unusual results. Gone were the labels, the logos, the bias and the brick walls when representatives walk through the door at meetings. In the past, government bodies and community groups would mainly come together when there was a bit of a blue or a barney about something. Things like who wasn't doing their weeds on one side of the fence, that sort of thing. Now with doors being open and a spirit of collaboration, the old way of doing things was disappearing. The model with government on one side and community on the other was on the way out and instead government and community working in collaboration for the betterment of the environment. After all, a bird, a native plant or a weed for that matter doesn't recognise a fence or a boundary, so why should we? So an opportunity had arisen to consolidate this model and seek out other gains for the environment. Having partners such as government and non-government organisations provided a support mechanism and structure for officers, staff and the committee. Examples included HR, IR, financial subcommittees. This allowed for independent advice, exposure to other business models and representation on these committees. In terms of how the funding model developed, what was really interesting was the split. Less than half came from competitive grants, mainly from government, whereas more than half came from partnerships and fee-for-service. The majority of this investment is now ongoing or long-term with recurrent and multi-year contracts. This in turn provides security and certainty for program delivery, confidence in tenure for staff and therefore staff retention. But most importantly, most importantly, reliability for our groups schools and organisations that we support. I can't emphasise this enough. They can all rely on BCN year in, year out for the ongoing support, whilst continuing to grow our service delivery model. Now looking at staff and committee structure, we have our committee, the network members, the groups and organisations. The staff made up of the program manager, coastal program leader, environmental projects facilitator, biodiversity officer, communications coordinator, and land care facilitator. And while this next bit is a bit dry and boring, a good governance structure enables the rest of the organisation to achieve increased outcomes in the main game, the environment. Less time is now spent on wasted issues pertaining to HR and IR, et cetera and more time dedicated to action on the ground. This has led to a tenfold increase in projects and environmental initiatives, something we're immensely proud of. Importantly, having representatives providing advice to HR and finance subcommittees from the network agencies has seen significant improvements to the traditional land care model, specifically in relation to issues that commonly affect coordinators. They, these have been largely removed and it's led to a more cohesive and satisfied team. Conflict and conflict resolution in relation to staff matters is largely non-existent. This, I think, is an exception compared to many structures across the country. In different roles I've been part of and observed over 25 years in working across the state of Victoria and attending national conferences, this theme comes up time and time again. I've noted that networks tend to get bogged down on the HR and IR matters and coordinators come and go as their pays and entitlements are disputed. Delays in pays or fuel reimbursements, that sort of thing. Our structure and governance model has meant that coordinators and staff have felt more protected and valued as a result. 
To give an example, it's hard for a coordinator, often young or a graduate, to stand up in front of a volunteer committee and advocate for oneself in relation to award salary or other entitlements. This model of having agency and government reps on our HR and IR and finance subcommittees and part of our overall structure has to a large extent removed any bias and allowed for position and staff member protection and development. I firmly believe that this has underpinned a strong network, led to staff and IP retention and a strengthening of on-ground and environmental projects. However, our model has had, to, has had to be adaptable. With such a growing number of groups and organisations, the need to review our operations was and is pertinent. Meeting numbers, frequency, reporting and accountability has all been measured, reviewed and amended over the years, which is one indicator of an adaptable organisation and one which is prepared to change where and when required. Voting, group sizes, boundaries, etc., have all had their challenges over the journey. However, by ensuring that no matter what the size of the group, the name of the group and the focus of the group, everyone has an equal voice. And this has led to equality and greater outcomes. The BCN largely has a cohesive approach to the running of the network, valuing and appreciating how each group and land manager can contribute to the local and ballerine wide environmental initiatives has been the focus and this continues to the present day. Now this takes us to theme three with some examples across the community and what are some benefits. And I'll refer to the Ballerine Rail Trail as a really good example of this. This is one example of our many integrated projects. The Bellarine Rail Trail is 30 kilometres trail of connected vegetation across our landscape, with a landscape with over 95% of Indigenous vegetation removed. This linear corridor has enabled many links, connectivity and corridors to be established. Three community environment groups have a stake or interest in the rail trail with initiatives and working together has allowed many projects to flow. Other examples include the Bridal Creeper Leafhopper and Rust Fungus Project and Caring for Our Bays programs. These three groups work across the Ballerine Rail Trail with different areas and focus, but the same outcomes in mind. This one site, close to Swan Bay Ramsar Wetland, has seen all the groups contribute over the years with restoration and rehabilitation works. Weeds, including spiny rush and fennel, have been removed and revegetation has taken place, turning a negative into a positive. This now serves as a demonstration site for other projects and properties around the region. From this integrated approach, numerous resources have come to fruition, flora and fauna booklets and other environmental resources. The booklet on the right Discover the Real Ocean Grove was a result of one of the non-traditional groups leading this project with the Ocean Grove Community Association providing funding and support. Other groups, including Ocean Grove Coast Care Group, Friends of Ocean Grove Nature Reserve, Friends of Begola Wetlands, Bar and Estuary Project, Bar and Coast Committee of Management and City of Greater Geelong, all collaborated and the result is this highly valued publication with 3,000 copies running out the door and out of print within the first three months, requiring an urgent reprint to meet demand. Our version of the popular Gardens for Wildlife program links in with existing community and environment groups in each of the towns and areas of the Ballerine. This provides support and linking other programs for environmental groups to be part of. And this in turn drives community interest and membership in the relevant environment groups. Over the years, we've tried to win the hearts and minds of the community through different ways. We've partnered with the Arts and Culture Department of the City of Greater Geelong for a number of years now, delivering a range of art and environment initiatives. 
This has provided funding, connections and opportunities for the environment, many of which were new or a new way of looking at things. Examples of this include biodiversity in your backyard, mountain to mouth extreme arts walk, festival of glass with Drysdale Clifton Springs Community Association, orange belly parrot mural and more. This one project is at the bus hub in Drysdale in the centre of the Ballerine, with four schools utilising it daily, focusing on the critically endangered orange-bellied orange parrot and involving a local artist working with local students. This bus hub has around 2,000 students per day go past this site. There are eight bus shelters, all with OBP murals. After seven years, this site has never been tagged or vandalised and connects the kids daily to the environment and the plight of the OBP. We have a growing number of YouTube videos currently sitting at nine and by the end of the year should be around 13. This provides extension and reach in the way we engage with our communities and schools. Summer by the Sea program in partnership with the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, Coast Care Victoria, Ballerine Bay Side, City of Greater Geelong and Borough of Queenscliff has been another success story. Focusing on holiday makers and local residents over the summer, this has added a new program, a new funding stream and engagement opportunities for holiday makers and residents alike. Surf clubs and nippers environment sessions. Partnering with the local surf clubs has led to more opportunities also. With a captured audience, in an established, well-loved and well-respected program. We've been able to engage with hundreds of nippers per year in environmental themes. From themes like don't play in the dunes through to litter reduction and protected species like hooded plovers. The nippers receive a fun, interactive program linking the beach and foreshore with the marine environment. Their primary focus is on preserving lives and how to stay safe on the beach and in the water. And now we have added how to look after and protect the coastal environment. This was a simple and effective fit, valued by all. In the early days, it was us driving the interest with the clubs and the nippers. Now it's the clubs that come to us first to lock in dates and activities for the following year. A true indication of the value the surf clubs place on, this, on these activities. The annual schools program is perhaps our most significant reach and advances in our program areas. It provides reliability for schools being the key. In the early, early years, it was a bit hit and miss. One year an activity, then a gap, then another year activity, then another gap. Around a decade ago, we started to link the years through, year on year on year, school after school. What we realised was that you can't do every class of every year level of every school, but you can do every school. We target a year level and then every year when the kids get to that year level, they get the intensive program of environment days and follow up support. What follows is ownership, connections and a deeper understanding and respect are the results. With each school having a site they have adopted from woodlands, grasslands, wetlands, beaches and foreshores, they have all been taken into each school's reach and broader program. And now with this well-established program, we've developed it into a leadership program for each school and the keen students. This reliable school program is now extending to other areas and opportunities. This new program in its inaugural year has seven schools involved and 17 students taking part and takes the schools on a more intensive deeper program and learning around their environment. Iconic locations, places and photos always helps with inspiration, grants and funding. This site in Eastern Beach, Geelong, during each summer has over 1 million people visit the beach and Esplanade. We are able to leverage from images like this, building the connection with schools and community groups to access grants and awards. 
Caring for Our Bays and Litter Hotspots is another program that did not exist pre-2010. Being open to, to new initiatives, new partners, new investors had led to significant outcomes for BCN. This program identified and focused on 15 litter hotspots around Geelong and the Ballerine. The program identified the litter sources, identified source reduction initiatives and worked with land managers and community groups to reverse the trend. The, pro the program has been a standout success and was one that we could have easily said no to at the time. We developed our local hero species for each area to get behind. This has been scalable with posters, conny cards, through to mural size for each species. The amount of species continues to grow also. This concept has proved to be very successful with the community being able to make a connection with what actually lives in the bays and oceans. This side of Clifton Springs was a fisher's litter hotspot. With not a lot of love for the marine life and the coastal foreshore, the turnaround has been staggering with all community and land managers coming on board to reduce the litter trend. And now a new Clifton Springs Curlewis Coast Care Group being formed. The transformation has been amazing. We have businesses now participating alongside land managers, community groups and schools and a new program attached called Businesses Caring for Our Bays. I always flinch and check myself a bit when I tell this story and show this slide, but it was a significant learning for us. The learning was sometimes you have to work with the cause to find the solution. At this drive through and exit points, we placed our hero species around. This was meant to serve as a gentle reminder not to turn up at the beach or the creek or the local reserve and leave your rubbish behind. At the creek adjoining this facility in North Geelong, where litter from the known restaurant was high, bit by bit the numbers decreased. And as you can see from the trend line in the graph, and the brand that partnered with us with the signage was less prominent when we did our litter monitoring and pickups. Interestingly, at the same location, another very famous restaurant was approached to be part of the program, but they declined. Their litter amount, however, did not decline at the site we monitored. The lesson for us, it took many, many, many meetings to get this over the line. Initially, they were protecting their brand and scared of repercussions, but they came on board and now are strong advocates for the program. Office Works were a similar example. Initially, there was hesitation to get involved, then partnerships formed with BCN as, and a significant reduction in litter resulted from car parking tickets by simply putting a bin on the right hand side of the image you can see there, through to packaging and cigarette butt bins. Overall, of the 14 litter hotspot sites, we have seen a trend line reduction of litter across all sites. This trend has been maintained with all sectors, land managers, community groups, recreational users, schools and businesses playing a role. And the reach just keeps on continuing to grow. From music festivals to sporting events, BCN is present giving the environment a voice. From swimming races around the bay, removing the use of single use plastics to Queenscliff Music Festival, who significantly reduced the waste going to landfill and are nearly completely reusable. This has been the result of engaging with the events sector. Suddenly then you turned around and realised your organisation and programs have a profile. In 2019, we held the Caring for Our Bays Conference with Craig Rewcastle as the keynote speaker. 150 delegates featuring schools, community groups, land managers, and importantly, the business sector were in attendance. The growth in the business sector, engaging with them and bringing them on board to invest in local initiatives has been the result of raising this profile of the environment locally. We are all familiar of the reporting merry-go-round. Apply for a grant, get the grant, try to deliver the project with a small amount of project management funds, and then report using the usual reporting template, which rarely sells the story of what has been really achieved. All this applies to us, 
but with one difference and addition. Each activity, event and project receives an additional report on top of the usual reporting template from the investor. This report is image rich with a short narrative and combines figures. This simple yet effective additions has led to greater confidence from our investors and in turn, no doubt, led to more investment. A minor change with a big impact. In theme four, now I would like to look at the following. Any take home messages? What can your group take from this? How can you benefit? This is where it all comes together. This integrated model of community groups and land managers have allowed invest investment opportunities of a broad and interesting mix, as well as reliability of funding has led to different groups and organisations increasing their environmental initiatives. With the diversity of partnerships, this continues to bring success. Often one partnership will lead to another and the word of the BCN as a service provider, leader in education and engagement becomes self-fostering. By spreading the risk, this leads to a more robust model of delivery. It means you can plan ahead for the following and sometimes multiple years with confidence rather than planning for just one year, one year at a time. The realisation around a decade ago that the government funding model was decreasing and becoming more competitive led the BCN to diversify. This remains the case today. Local, state and federal grants of funding will always play an important role. But a model reliant just on this is risky and does not allow for bold planning for projects, confidence with service delivery and retention of staff and recurrent projects. I mentioned at the start around advocacy. The community's expectation around this has increased with significant pressures through development and development related pressures. These circles represent current growth areas. The communities rely on the BCN and other groups to advocate on their behalf and we need to continue to be adaptable and flexible as the issues, threats and demands change. I always try to reflect on the fact that the community groups don't need to be there. They do it for their love, commitment and passion for the local and connected environment. And I think it, it is incumbent on all decision makers and land managers to remember this. Imagine just for a moment, if they had all had enough one day and shut up shop and they weren't there. How many projects and initiatives and support, whether it be on ground with weeding, revegetation, erosion control, advocacy or education would also go with them. All the projects you've seen today are part and parcel of all the community groups that are on the Ballerine Peninsula and we need to continue to support them. At the outset, I wanted to make clear that this model is not for everyone. All groups, networks incorporate what works for their areas. They're tried and they're tested and meeting the needs and demands of that area. But I've also seen that many groups and networks are keen to see what others do and then change, add, or improve to their existing models. I did not ascribe that the BCN model is perfect, far from it, and we are always tweaking and looking for ways to improve, but it has its advantages, and these advantages have led to a more robust, reliant, and recurrent funding model and programs. The fact that BCN had an integrated catchment model to begin with was then able to foster, nurture and expand on this and finally was open to new initiatives, programs and funding streams has all led to improvements. After years and decades of solid federal government investment through programs you may recall, such as the Natural Heritage Trust, NHT, 
National Action Plan, NAP, and Caring for Our Country, CFOC, the federal investment pool diminished and the writing was on the wall. It was time to diversify or die. We chose to diversify, and this has seen a slow but continual strengthening of our program over the years. So I hope there might be at least one takeaway from you from the 40 odd minutes that you've spent with me. In the same way, I ask a school group of kids to remember one plant name from a field trip rather than 20 plant names. Maybe there is one idea to take to your groups, networks, committees and managers. And if there's more than one, well, even better. Just before I make some acknowledgements, if you have any questions, feel free to lodge them now and we'll allow a few minutes at the end to answer them. I'd like to finish up with a few things. Firstly, some acknowledgements. Mr. Graham O'Leary, the president of Ballerine Catchment Network. BCN committee, Graham O'Leary, Margot Bush, Michael Skinner, Jane Morrow, Heather Williams, and Peter Smith. BCN staff, Angie Poole, Lachlan Forbes, Sophie Small, Naomi Wells, Rebecca St. Ledger. Naomi Wells for presentation, layout, design, communications, and IT support. And the land care team of Trisha Gorman and Rowan Anto. To contact us, go to the following social media and website. Finally, our program is made up of all the groups and organisations you have seen and I've mentioned today. I would like to thank and acknowledge all of them and the many colleagues, friends and names that I have not had time to mention today. This is the BCN model, these groups and organisations, and it's been a delight to present this model to you and serve them for the past 13 years. My colleague Naomi has been collating and moderating some questions and now I'll try to answer some of them for you. Okay, you might need to exit the full screen to be able to see the comment box as well. Okay, I'll just take a moment to draw breath and um, take a little sip of water. Okay, so one of the first questions is about how you go about developing non-traditional strategies. So that's a really good question and there's probably a, a number of ways to answer that. In terms of the, um, the community groups, as being non-traditional, I guess it was a mixture of different community groups coming to us and asking, how do we get involved in the environment? How do we get involved in the tree planting day or something similar? And as I mentioned, they could have been neighborhood houses or community associations or CFA or scout groups, whatever the case might be. And I'm sure in many of your areas, you have similar examples. And I guess it's depending on your landscape where you are. For us, as I mentioned, we're by the coast, so we have surf clubs so we can engage with them as some of those examples. If you're inland, you might not have that, but there might be another other well-established community group that you can link in with. And I suppose the point that I try to emphasise is that's added to our organisation by opening our doors and allowing them in. We've diversified, it's brought in more opportunities and again, um, we're not always just preaching to the converted, which is um, rewarding and you're certainly able to get more done. In terms of investment, I guess it's also been an approach where we've advocated for ourselves. We've gone to different partners and we've um, approached them with a program that's investable and um, we've been able to develop it up from there. It often takes a slow approach, um, a little bit of skepticism to begin with a bit like a door-to-door -door salesman, sort of you're a bit conscious of selling your product, but essentially we've been able to develop up the confidence and relationships with the different um, investors out there from the business sector as well. So we've got a question from Melissa here about how do you interact with these groups? 
It's a really good question. And I think it's, it's often by a case by case scenario. So because we've got a lot of established programs, a lot of established sites, we're able to identify what the group is and see if that fits in with a particular project, a particular site or theme or something like that as well. And often it makes sense that if they've got an interest, then you look to um, link into that rather than coming up with something that's not relevant. So I guess relevance is the key there. We always try to make it relevant. And that's what we've tried to do. Um, we're lucky where we've got different landscapes and so we're able to relate to whether it's a, a wetland landscape, woodlands, grasslands or foreshore areas as well. So certainly in our situation, our landscape lends itself to a diversity of those different scenarios and opportunities as well. Sorry, I'll just pause for a moment. Okay, so interacting with the 32 groups is a challenge and that number's grown as we've had other groups um, develop as well. I guess that gets back to that, that structure of running our, our meetings, etc. So we have two representatives from each of our 32 groups and organisations that um, attend meetings and are the representatives from those groups and organisations. We're not, our structure doesn't um, look for members like a traditional group might be that are trying to um, always, you know, get more members. We have the, the group that becomes the member and then they determine who the representatives are that come along to the meetings. And then really it's about, it's really our meetings are about information sharing, developing projects and initiatives from there. And many of the examples that I presented today can't fall out of those meetings and those formats as well. Often there are challenges, there's still debates around a range of you know, difficult topics, but more often than not, that's where the programs and projects evolve from. And I guess that is one of the main purposes of that network and that structure. It's that coming together, that sharing, trying to leave, you know, um, bias or whatever it might be at the door and collaborating that way. And again, as I mentioned, that's, that's our model. And I'm sure that type of model exists in many other, you know, with, um, regions around the country and no doubt many people that are listening to this have forms of those structures as well but um the key is as i talked about it's the diversity um everyone's welcome as long as they you know they fit in with the values um but it's certainly enriched our organization in so many ways it's made it more also interesting a little bit more challenging at times but certainly uh, more productive for the environment and it always comes back to how is this project or this group or this initiative going to protect, enhance, improve the environment? And that's the measure of, um, you know, involving other groups as well. Um, just looking for some other questions. So we've got a question around from Janet around what kind of office space do you work from and do you share with other networks or groups? So our office space is quite interesting. It's a bit of a story, but I'll try to uh, summarise it very quickly. It's actually an old CFA building that was donated to Ballerine Catchment Network. So we actually um, uh, we actually own our own building, which gives us some some confidence in terms of planning around the infrastructure needs that we have. We have um, an on-ground work shed where we have our trailers and um, different on-ground works um, resources. And then we have our, our staff room area where we have our meetings and our staff sit. We have um, Ballerine Catchment Network and Ballerine Landcare Group um, staff that work out of this centre. But we also have hot desks that um, people from other organisations can come and work out of as well. And because we're centrally lo located and because of our network structure, often other organisations hold meetings here because it's just convenient or it's central as well. So um, yeah, that's a quick answer to that question of where we operate out of. Fantastic. So thanks to Naomi Wells, who's helped uh, with the moderating of the questions. And I've just been asked to say that everyone will get a link 
of the recording. So you'll be able to um, go to that link and go back on any of the information, some of the links to um, websites and YouTube and the like. And also encourage you to connect with Land Carer and connect with myself and the BCN uh, team around any follow-up questions, etc. There's so much more, of course, I would have liked to have said and could have expanded on, but there's opportunities to dig a little deeper on any of those projects. Um, Project. So I've just got a question. Do projects from other groups and land care groups within your area become part of your list of projects? Denise Goodwin. The answer to that is probably twofold. Some of them do. Some of them, the groups um, might come up with the idea or we come up with the idea and go to the group where there's an opportunity or an issue or something like that. And we often will run it on behalf of the group if it's got a technical aspect or requiring resources and then it becomes a bit of a combined project. But all the groups that I listed, and of course the organisation that have land management responsibilities, their own responsibilities, but particularly the community groups, they're running a whole range of other groups, I'm sorry, of other projects alongside. Every group's active in different ways. Some have more of an on-ground focus, whereas some might have more of an education focus, but they all have numerous other projects on top of the ones that we listed. I guess the ones that I've listed have more of that spread across um, clusters of groups or geographic areas and quite often across the whole of the Ballerine as well. And that's our model because of course, we're a network that's sort of spread across all these groups and areas also. So I hope I've answered that one um, to some degree for Denise there as well. So once again, I just like to really thank um, Landcare Australia Limited and the Landcare platform and everyone that registered for the presentation and took time out to, um, to listen to me uh, bang on for 40 minutes or so. I've enjoyed the opportunity to talk about our model. And as I said, I just hope there might be something that's of value that you can take away to help to advance your cause to your networks, groups and organisations. And thank you once again and goodbye.